In the wild, different animal species often cooperate to achieve their goals. This type of relationship is called symbiosis. Let me tell you about some of the most astonishing examples of symbiosis. In the wild, there's a fascinating phenomenon where coyotes and badgers are seen traveling together. From an outsider's perspective, it looks like something out of a Disney cartoon, where animals of different species become friends. Sometimes the group is made up of one badger and two coyotes, and very rarely you might see three coyotes and one badger together. So why do coyotes and badgers travel together? It's all about mutually beneficial cooperation. Each one is incredibly useful to the other. These animals surprisingly make up for each other's weaknesses. Both coyotes and badgers have very similar diets, but the prey they hunt typically lives in burrows and can run fast. Unlike the coyote, the badger is excellent at digging out burrows, but it's slow. So if the prey escapes its burrow, the coyote, being much faster, can chase it down. If the coyote catches it, it keeps it, but if the prey runs back into a burrow while escaping the coyote, the badger takes over and gets the prey for itself. In this partnership, these animals are much more effective than they would be alone. According to some studies, coyotes hunting alongside badgers Badgers catch 34% more rodents than solitary coyotes. This doesn't mean these animals are friends, they're essentially competing for the same food. It's just that this way, the coyote and badger save energy by sharing the work of catching both fast and hidden prey using each other's hunting skills. However, a camera set up near a highway in Northern California captured a moment showing a coyote clearly displaying friendly behavior toward a badger. And this isn't the first time such behavior has been observed in coyotes. Well, exceptions do happen. This is an owl. It raises its chicks in a nest, feeding them various worms and rodents. Over time, food scraps begin to rot, and the nest becomes filled with insect larvae. This poses a significant risk to the chick's health, so the mother does something incredible. She goes hunting for a creature known as the narrow-mouthed snake. Typically, owls hunt snakes to eat them, but not this one. The owl knows that the narrow-mouthed snake feeds on insect larvae, so she drops it into her nest, where it cleans out all the unwelcome guests. As a result, the owl gets a clean nest, and the snake gets plenty of food. It's amazing how the owl overrides its predatory instincts to keep the nest clean. Now, let's move to the tropics, to the island of Borneo. In its mountainous regions, due to the heavy rainfall, water washes all the nutrients from the soil. To survive in these conditions, carnivorous plants have evolved, which you've probably heard of. These plants secrete nectar to attract insects and other small creatures, which then fall into a pitcher filled with digestive fluid. There, they decompose, providing the plant with sustenance. But what you might not know is that some of these plants have formed a fascinating symbiotic relationship with bats. This particular plant is called called a Nepenthes, and it needs something more substantial than an insect. It's waiting for a specific visitor. This Nepenthes species doesn't rely on nectar as bait. Instead, its lid is perfectly shaped to reflect sonar signals. The plant uses this to attract bats, which readily crawl inside. But the bat is perfectly safe. After a night of hunting, it needs a place to rest, and it won't fall into the deadly liquid below. The bat comfortably settles into the pitcher's conical cup. On a hot day, the pitcher's waxy walls offer a cool retreat. The benefit to the plant becomes clear in the evening. Evening. The bat wakes up, lazily climbs out of the flower and heads off to hunt again, but it leaves behind a valuable payment, nutrient-rich droppings, known as guano. This provides the plant with one of the most valuable nutritional resources in Borneo. To understand just how valuable it is, let's take a look inside a nearby cave on this very island. Here, a massive colony of bats gathers each night, and their droppings rain down, forming towering mountains of guano, some over 15 meters high. These guano piles support the largest concentration concentration of cockroaches in the world, but that's not all. They also feed a huge number of other creatures, like the common centipede, the giant cave spider, and even the cave crab. Thanks to the bats and their guano, even in this harsh environment, a vast number of creatures can thrive. It's no wonder that a whole war over the right to possess guano was fought in the movie Ace Ventura 2. In front of you is a fig tree, the only tree in this entire forest where fruit grows all year round. Its flowers grow in dense clusters inside the unripe figs, but they haven't been pollinated yet, which makes the fruit inedible. Fig lovers, like gibbons, will have to wait. To produce ripe fruit, the tree needs help from some of the forest's smallest residents, fig wasps. They are only two millimeters long. The fig tree has developed a unique partnership with these tiny insects. The female wasp has just one day when the fruit will allow her to burrow inside. The tunnel is so narrow that it tears off her wings, but she won't need them anymore. Once inside, she makes her way to 
to the tiny, tightly packed flowers. Then, she lays hundreds of eggs. After that, the wasp carefully takes fig pollen from a cavity in her abdomen and pollinates the tiny flowers. Having laid her eggs, she dies inside the unripe fig. Sunlight helps the fruit slowly ripen, and the young wasps develop inside. Five weeks later, the wasps begin to hatch. The first to emerge are golden, wingless males. And then something astonishing happens. These males start mating with their sisters, who haven't even hatched yet. They use a telescopic penis that is twice their body length. As their sisters, now pregnant, begin to hatch, the males start digging a path to the outside world, to the fresh air. The brothers' final act is quite noble. They sacrifice themselves to marauding ants. In this way, the males serve as decoys while their sisters escape from the fruit. The young females, covered in pollen, live for only 48 hours. During this time, they must find another fig tree with unripe fruit to burrow into, just like their mothers did. In the end, everyone benefits. The tree gets pollinated and the wasps have a place to breed. It's an ideal symbiosis and its effects benefit thousands of different animal species that eat the figs, which ripen thanks to this partnership between the wasp and the tree. This isn't the only example of cooperation between wasps and plants. For instance, when hungry caterpillars attack the leaves of some types of cabbage, the damaged leaves release a chemical distress signal that attracts wasps. The wasps then happily come to deal with the invading caterpillars. This way, the wasps get food and the cabbage gets its leaves protected. Let's travel to Africa. Here, while zebras graze on grass, giraffes reach for something higher. This plant is called an acacia. It's tempting with its young leaves, but they're guarded by long thorns. Even so, the giraffe's tongue, which is half a meter long, can easily handle them. But the acacia has another defense mechanism. It works together with these insects. When disturbed, an army of acacia ants comes to the rescue. They bite wherever they can, forcing the giraffe to move away. The acacia grows special, swollen thorns to house its loyal army. Inside Inside small cups, the plant produces a nutritious nectar, specifically so the ants don't wander far and can feed right there. It's simply ingenious. Sometimes in the jungle, you'll find areas where only one or two types of trees grow. Locals call these places devil's gardens and believe that spirits kill off the other trees. But in reality, it's not spirits. It's another species of ants that also cooperate with the tree. The surviving trees have special hollow areas that serve as homes for ant colonies. The tree benefits a lot from this partnership because the ants not only protect its leaves from pests, but also kill any other types of trees within a few meters. The ants bite the competing plants, inject their venom, and the plant ants die, leaving their host tree to absorb all the nutrients from the soil. This clever tree has eliminated all its competition. It's brilliant, a remarkable example of symbiosis but not as remarkable as our next example. This is a sloth. It's incredibly slow, making it an easy target for predators, but it has come up with a different strategy. It has formed a symbiotic relationship with these insects, which it breeds in large numbers on its body. There are several different species, but most are moth-like butterflies that live nowhere else but in a sloth's fur. But why does it need them? It's simple. Dead insects and their droppings feed the algae that grow directly on the sloth's fur, thanks to the many grooves in each hair. This unappealing covering makes the fur smell bad, helping the sloth go unnoticed by predators. Every week, the sloth makes a dangerous trip down to the ground for the sake of these butterflies. It risks becoming a predator's meal. Other animals living in trees try to avoid doing this, but the sloth has no choice. It needs to breed these moth-like butterflies. When it reaches the ground, the female butterflies hop off the sloth and lay their eggs in its droppings. Larvae hatch from these eggs, feeding on the droppings until they become butterflies and find another sloth. To complete the butterfly, fly life cycle, the sloth is willing to take this risk because it can't survive without them. Otherwise, predators would notice it and it wouldn't make it. Take a look at this massive spider. This is a tarantula, and these next to it are frogs. Tarantulas usually eat frogs, but not these ones. They have a mutually beneficial relationship. The tarantula's egg sacs are often infested with insects, but these frogs take care of the problem by eating all the pests. In return, the tarantula acts as a bodyguard for the frogs. For instance, when this owl decides it wants a frog snack, the tarantula steps in. It turns its back and starts releasing barbed hairs, which cause severe irritation to predators when they get into their eyes. As a result, the owl flies away, the frogs stay safe, and the tarantula's eggs remain intact. Everyone's happy.
Next, we have perhaps one of the most incredible examples of symbiosis in nature. This here is a plant called Roridula. It's covered in hairs tipped with sticky droplets of glue. The glue's scent attracts insects, and once they land, they get stuck and can't escape. So you might wonder, why does the Roridula trap insects? What does it do with them? It's hard to believe, but the plant does this solely to feed this assassin bug, which is found nowhere else but on the Roridula. Unlike other insects, the assassin bug doesn't stick to the plant's glue because its body is coated with an oily substance. It approaches the trapped prey, pierces it with its proboscis, and sucks out its juices. But why does the plant feed the assassin bug? It turns out that the Roridula does this so that the bug can defecate as much as possible. Its droppings fall to the ground, and that's what the Roridula feeds on. This warthog is desperate to scratch an itch because it's being bitten all day long by a swarm of fleas. Unfortunately, warthogs don't have hands, so they can't scratch themselves. But this one has found a solution. It's heading over to a local beauty salon run by its friends, the mongooses. Finally, the warthog gets some much needed relief and the mongooses get a feast of tasty fleas. Take a look at this footage. Here are the sharp-bellied ants, and they're quite unusual. These tiny creatures are just five millimeters long and build their homes in dry plants and inside trees. Along their trails, you'll notice scattered eggs, which the ants collect. These are the eggs of the silvery butterfly. When the caterpillars hatch, the ants have even more work to do. They're very interested in these caterpillars. They pick up the silvery butterfly caterpillars and carry them into their nest. Many ants participate in this. What happens to the caterpillars taken by the ants? A year goes by. A large caterpillar appears at the entrance of the ant colony. What happened inside? It might look like she's escaping, but this is the same caterpillar they took a year ago. Now she's much bigger than her captors. Occasionally the caterpillar crawls outside, but she spends most of her life inside the tree with the ants. But how did the caterpillar survive inside the tree with the ants for an entire year? If you look closely, you can see that the ants are feeding the caterpillar. They're regurgitating food for it. From the moment this caterpillar hatched, she's been constantly feeding on what the ants regurgitate. In other words, the silvery butterfly caterpillar was able to grow only because of the food provided by the ants. Before the caterpillar pupates, something even stranger happens. The ants start biting one of their own eggs and then carry this egg to the caterpillar. The caterpillar eats the egg, which gives it the protein it needs to pupate. After this, it does indeed pupate. And throughout this process, the ants continue to guard it. After some time, it transforms into a butterfly and leaves the ants. Why did the ants help the caterpillar? What was the point of all all this. The truth is, these ants are addicts. In fact, we're looking at an entire colony of addicts, and the caterpillar produces the substance to which the entire colony has become addicted. When the ants stimulate the caterpillar's tail, it releases a sweet substance which, according to butterfly experts, is highly addictive. For this substance, these ants have evolved to care for the caterpillars, and the caterpillars have evolved so that the ants would feed them. The substance released by the caterpillar is addictive but harmless to the ants. On the contrary, it satisfies satisfies their energy needs. But whether this small advantage is worth the effort spent caring for the caterpillar is debatable. And that's why scientists believe they do this only because of the strong addiction caused by the substance. In the ocean, we can see a truly unusual partnership. Many types of goby fish live alongside various species of crustaceans from the snapping shrimp family. These creatures have learned to cooperate in order to survive. Goby fish are unable to dig burrows, so the snapping shrimp take on this task. However, these small crustaceans have poor eyesight and cannot see approaching danger, so the gobies assume this role. Their vision is much better and they constantly survey the area. As soon as danger approaches, the goby signals and they both quickly hide. Even after the burrow is dug, the the goby still needs the snapping shrimp, because without them the burrow would quickly fill with sand. Ultimately, these animals of different species are dependent on each other. In the sandy expanses of the ocean floor, finding a safe place to hide can be a real challenge, but a family of striped clownfish has discovered the perfect home. This creature is called a sea anemone, and its tentacles are deadly. Clownfish, however, are immune to its poison, allowing them to seek refuge from predators within its grasp. In return, the fish keep the anemone clean by removing debris. They clean it thoroughly and regularly, creating a perfect example of symbiosis. The female is ready to lay her eggs, but there's no solid surface nearby to attach them to. So, the fish need to get creative. A nearby shell seems like a good option, but it's too heavy to drag under the anemone's protective cover. What's more, the shell already has an occupant. Luckily, twice a day, the anemone is swept by tidal currents, which bring new possibilities. An old plastic bottle floats by. Perhaps this is just what they need. The fish try to push 
push it, but it's too light for their purposes. But soon the current carries in a coconut shell, which is exactly what they're looking for. However, the shell is far from their home, and the male can't move it on his own. Then, the rest of the family joins in and the fish begin to work together. Each one takes a turn pushing, relieving the others. Little by little, they gradually nudge the shell towards the anemone. Then, the fish lift the anemone to place their find underneath. It's incredible to watch. Finally, the female can lay her eggs in a safe place. The male then fertilizes the eggs and carefully looks after them until the young hatch in about 10 days. Now let's travel to Africa, where a rhinoceros seeks water to escape the unbearable heat. The cool mud soothes the overheated male. He suffers not only from the heat, but also from blood-sucking ticks. Therefore, the rhinoceros relies on some natural beauticians to help him, and they are quick to arrive. These are African helmeted turtles. These turtles love to pluck ticks from the giant's old, wrinkled skin. Everyone benefits. The rhinoceros gets rid of parasites, and the turtles get a meal. Meanwhile, on the Galapagos Islands, a different scene unfolds. Crabs feed on the dead skin on the backs of iguanas, providing them with a free professional peeling. At the same time, small lizards hunt the flies that constantly annoy the iguana colony. This type of symbiosis is very common in the natural world. Even in the ocean, some fish clean others. Some of these cleaners are brave enough to swim right into the mouths of predatory fish without fear of being eaten. They're like underwater dentists. But the most amazing example of this kind of teamwork might be the ocean sunfish. This huge fish swims into shallow waters just to have smaller fish remove its parasites. Up to 50 different kinds of parasites can live on a single sunfish, and sometimes the cleaning fish can't get rid of all of them. That's when the sunfish does something incredible. It looks for another specialist. The fish floats to the surface right next to a seagull. The seagull pecks off the toughest parasites, and finally the clean sunfish can continue its journey. This just goes to show how amazing the animal world truly is. That's all for now. Don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel, and check out the two previous videos.